Happy Friday, folks. Senior Editor Mackenzie DeLulo here, and welcome back to the Texans Weekly Roundup podcast. This week, the team discusses Congressman Chip Roy endorsing Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, a Texas lawmaker filing a bill to increase penalties for those who commit assault, resulting in paralysis. The Senate voting to restore the felony offense for illegal voting. A Senate school choice plan that grants thousands of dollars per student. The House proposing to create a border protection unit and invoke the constitutional invasion clause. The legislature considering a lightning rod local preemption bill. Five election reform bills uh, receiving hearings in the Senate well, State it, Affairs it, Committee. It was the Texas Representative shock, Nate Schatzlein you know, proposing an age verification hours, requirement for groggy. websites hosting but explicit material. The House and Senate's fight over appraisals and exemptions in their property tax relief discussions. A lawmaker aiming to allow minors in attendance at drag shows to sue the performers. President Biden issuing an executive order to curb gun violence, promoting red flag laws and universal background checks. And the Texas state police (laughs) warning residents to avoid traveling to Mexico after two Americans were murdered there last week. As always, if you have questions for our team, DM us on Twitter or email us at editor at the Texan.news. We'd love to answer your questions on a future podcast. Thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Howdy folks, Mackenzie here with Brad, Cameron, Matt, and Hayden on another episode. Gentlemen, thanks for joining. I have a question. Daylight savings time. All week this week, I have felt very tired and off kilter and it's ridiculous because it's only an hour difference but i also think allergens are really high this year brad you so kindly blowing your nose before we started the podcast is what made me think of that Uh, do y'all also like i feel lethargic more lethargic this week because of the the time change and maybe the allergens but i don't feel like i'm that my allergies have been bothering me yeah do you feel more like how quickly did y'all get over daylight savings well oh sorry well it was the initial shock. Yeah. You know, yeah. For the first 48 hours. Yeah. Yes, it is yeah. very nice. I agree with that. After work, go for a walk. You know, because in this office, if you're listening, you have no windows. We have no windows. So when we leave the office, you get smacked in the face with the sun. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. The <laughs> outside been, world. I've been missing out on it. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing worse than leaving the office and it being dark by the time you get home. Yeah. If not before you leave the office. And that's miserable. Yeah. So I'm a big fan of daylight saving time. I always forget, but I do know it. That piece of information is in my brain, but I don't know it. Are are you pro or uh, against daylight saving time? Very pro. Not to get political, because I know it's very political, this topic in the Texas legislature and legislatures across the country. And the federal level too. Yeah. I may, kind of wish we didn't on it this session. Yeah. Although well, Congress they say that would have to permit it regardless. Yeah. So go to the Texas News to read more about it. And gosh darn it, you can't cover it anymore because you just took a position. Oh, crap. So. <laughs> <laughs> I am. It's not like it's a life or death right. issue. I am pro ending daylight saving time. Anybody Why? else willing to take a a stand today? I have no strong feelings either way i think it's a little bit fun to change the clocks but i wouldn't be i probably wouldn't even notice if we ended daylight savings time yeah i i would be pro if i didn't have to reset a bunch of clocks that's that's the thing i get in my car clock is wrong my oven clock is wrong it's just an inconvenience yeah and then you forget the one random micro like with the one random appliance it's always a microwave I still haven't changed the clock in my own. <laughs> my family lives in Arizona and they don't observe daylight saving time. And there's not much difference. The only problem is I can never remember what time of the year they're an hour or two hours behind. Like it's very difficult for me to remember. I'll, I'll call and be disappointed that it, they're no, they're not awake in that early in the morning. Or, you know, like it, it, it changes based on us here in Texas and their time to never changes. So there is a little bit of like logistics that make I'm it. I'm just difficult. picturing one of your siblings, like, groggy, <laughs> looking at seven a.m. and I'm like, guys, I've been up for a few hours. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay. Well, on that note, let's get into the news this week. Brad, a surprising 2024 presidential endorsement from Texas came out this week. What happened? 
Yeah, very surprising. Uh, I would say it was um, Congressman Chip Roy. He sent out an email to his campaign list in which he endorsed Florida Governor Ron DeSantis for the 2024 GOP presidential nomination. The interesting part is DeSantis has not announced. <laughs> but um, it, it's... I don't know why that was so funny. <laughs> it's pretty much an open secret that he's at least strongly considering it. If he's not already, you know, laid the groundwork for an well, he was running ads in Iowa, wasn't yeah, he? Right, yeah, right, right. Like, so it's probably going to happen, uh, especially if someone like Chip Roy is coming out and taking a stand on it, taking a position. I would say that's a pretty good indicator that uh, DeSantis is going to jump in. But of course, things change. Who knows what is going to happen? But in his endorsement, Roy said, America needs a leader who will truly defend her and empower the people against the destructive force of unrestrained government and corporate excess, profligate spending, and woke cultural indoctrination. That leader is Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Um, As I said, DeSantis has not announced, uh, despite the basically open secret that he is going to run. But if he does, he will join a field currently of three people. If he joins, it'll be four. Of former President Donald Trump, he was the first to announce. He did it right after the midterm election. Um, Nikki Haley, former South Carolina governor and the UN ambassador during the Trump administration, or one of the UN ambassadors doing, during that. And then Vivek Ramaswamy, who is a, uh, a former pharmaceutical company executive. He started his own pharmaceutical company. And since probably 2019, he's been pretty big on um, political commentary, talking about ESG, hammering that, um, hammering COVID lockdowns, things like that. So uh, pretty far from what we saw in 2016 with just the sheer amount of people, but uh, who knows how many people will ultimately jump in. Yeah, absolutely. So did uh, Roy say anything about Trump directly? No, um, but the closest thing he came to doing so was saying DeSantis has also proven his ability to win at the ballot box time and time again when other Republicans were faltering in key races. Governor DeSantis provided a positive vision for the future with prudent conservative action. The result was crystal clear. Republicans enjoyed sweeping historic performances statewide. So the the two have two being Roy and Trump have a checkered past. Um, The reason I, think and i think a lot of people could rightly assume that that is at least tangentially related to the former president is that um during the the lackluster at least lackluster for national republicans midterm last year uh trump multiple trump candidates especially in the senate races did not win i think only one of his endorsed candidates in an open seat uh, won the race, and that was J.D. Vance in Ohio. Um, now his, his candidates performed very well in the, the primary. They got out of there. Um, but after the, uh, the lackluster midterm results, uh, there was a lot of uh, displeasure with the former president. And, but that seems to have kind of tempered out since then. But as far as Roy and Trump go, uh, the reason... The root of the disagreement between them is probably the 2020 election. Roy voted to certify the presidential lecture electors and objected to the results of the congressional elections to prove a point about the selective nature of congressional Republican strategy in contesting the 2020 results. He said that on the floor, got a lot of press for it, um, and got a lot of, of criticism from the former president. And then after that, Trump even suggested Roy would lose his 2022 primary, which he did not. Uh, Roy won that pretty easily. Um, And uh, yeah, so I think it's, while this endorsement is a surprise because DeSantis has not jumped in, I would say it's not really a surprise that Roy did not um, support Trump. However, he did say he will support whomever Republicans nominate in 2024. There you go. Brad, thanks for your coverage. Hayden, the Criminal Jurisprudence Committee passed legislation to increase the possible sentence for aggregated assault with a deadly weapon. Tell us about the text of this bill. There are some changes to state law that are just a few words, but they can have a profound effect. 
And I think that summarizes part of what is proposed in House Bill 28, which would amend the Code of Criminal Procedure to, or excuse me, the Penal Code to make aggravated assault with a deadly weapon a first degree felony if it results in a traumatic brain or spine injury to another that results in a persistent vegetative state or irreversible paralysis. This bill by Representative Shelby Slauson is designed to increase the maximum sentence available when someone suffers a bodily injury that leaves them uh, paralyzed or, as the text of the bill says, in a vegetative state. The bill passed 9-0 to zero in committee, so there was no opposition to the le- legislation, and it would, as I mentioned, increase the possible sentence for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, which currently can carry a sentence of 2 to 20 years in the state prison and a $10,000 fine. And then, of course, uh, probation is always on the table for uh, criminal cases. A first-degree felony carries a punishment of 5 to 99 years or life imprisonment and a $10,000 fine. So it would dramatically increase the punishment range available to prosecutors and judges in cases such as these. And it is named the Todd Hogland Act after some of the witnesses that we're about to discuss. Yeah, so who testified in favor of the bill? The testimony that was heard in favor of this bill was some of the more powerful testimony that I've heard when observing committee hearings. There are a lot of people who come to the Capitol, come to Austin of all types of political stripes, and they consider themselves victims. But these uh, crime victim survivors were truly survivors of the most extraordinary type of violence, uh, the type that everyone prays that they never have a family member suffer. Uh, But Brandy Todd is uh, paralyzed from the waist down after suffering a random assault by an individual in Erath County who, and I'm debating how how much detail to get into, but more or less she was stabbed and her her spinal cord was virtually severed um, and and she is now uh, paralyzed from the waist down because of that that attack and she described some of what her family has endured, some of the expense that she has had to um, that she has had to the, some of the money that she's had to spend to uh, adjust to life after this assault. And she concluded her remarks by saying, quote, I'm asking you to stand for those who can't stand for themselves. The man who stabbed me will be free in seven years, and I serve the life sentence, end quote. It was a closing statement that it was, like I said, one of the more powerful that I've heard. And I uh, talked to the Department of Criminal Justice yesterday. The male who assaulted her is in a psychiatric prison in East Texas that is a maximum security facility but he is scheduled to be released as early as 2030. And frankly, that's the latest he'll be released because he was given the maximum sentence. And it occurred to me as I was writing about this the other day, felons are not necessarily disqualified from social security benefits. So he may get out of prison just in time to start collecting federal checks and uh, retire in a lakefront somewhere. I don't, I don't know what felons do after they leave prison, but he there is no registry for people who do these types of things we have a a sex offender registry but we don't have a registry for people who sever other people's spinal cords so he will be released at the age of 62 or earlier another witness jessica hogland has lost her daughter after she became fully paralyzed because she was shot in the face by an individual who also received only a 20 year sentence And she said, quote, I'm asking you to do something to get peace of mind and a sense of justice for future victims and their families. The offender that hurt my daughter received a 20 year sentence and he could probably be out in just 10 years. Once he's released, he will then go back and proceed with his life like normal, whereas his actions caused lifelong damage and pain, end quote. And as I mentioned, her daughter has tragically passed away. So very powerful testimony in favor of this bill, which passed the committee unanimously. What are the next steps? 
Last session, this bill also passed criminal jurisprudence uh, unanimously, and it was put on the calendar for consideration, but the, the House floor, the House did not get to it uh, in time to consider it on the floor. The Calendars Committee has the same option this time. They can schedule the, the bill for floor consideration, place it on the general state calendar, but that is no guarantee that they'll get to it. There is also a uh, Senate com- Senate companion to this bill, Senate Bill 598 by Senator Birdwell. He's carrying this proposal in the Senate. Hey, and thanks for your coverage. Matt, legislation by Senator Brian Hughes passed this week in the Senate restoring the offense of illegal voting to a felony. What is the background on this law? Senator Hughes passed Senate Bill 2 through the Senate, increasing the offense of illegal voting, which includes things like voting someone else's ballot, voting in multiple elections at the same time, or voting when you know you are prohibited from doing so. Examples of this would be you're a convicted felon, you're a foreign national, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the increase was up to a third-degree felony from a Class A misdemeanor. Now, why was the offense reduced? Uh, Last session, an amendment by Representative Steve Allison was accepted by uh, the House to the election integrity legislation, uh, which numerous reps said that they didn't either read the amendment before accepting it or were not told it contained uh, this provision. Otherwise, they would have not accepted it. There's there's a lot of stories about how it it kind of got slipped on, and, and a lot of them vary. Uh, Long story short, they did, and it passed into the final bill. Uh, After that, during the special session, after the regular session, the Senate passed a fix, but the House refused to take the issue back up, and it has remained in state law during the past two years. Now, Democrats stood in unison this week against Hughes' bill, arguing numerous hypothetical situations trying to poke holes in the bill, which... Hughes argued back just on every point, but would also repeat time and time again that for the past 50 years, this was the law in Texas, and we didn't have the problems that the Democrats were suggesting during their arguments. Um, With those arguments being completed, uh, Hughes moved passage on the bill, and in two straight days, it passed uh, second and third reading, and the bill now Heads over to the House. Um, presently, Representative Steve Toth has filed an identical bill, um, as well as five other reps uh, filing similar bills to 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 correct the fix. Uh, it's unclear right now who will take it up in the House, but uh, we'll continue monitoring it on it and see where it goes. Absolutely, thank you, Matt. Cameron, the highly anticipated school choice plan was finally revealed by the Senate last week, but too late to be on the podcast. So let's talk about it now. What are some of the details? So, uh, yes, this was this came out late on uh, Friday last week, <laughs> and we were rushing to get it out, but we we got it out first. It, w- it was really fun, and um, Brad did help out a lot with that. So Cameron beat everybody. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. It, y'all killed it. So some of the details of it, um, it'll allow $8,000 for students moving um, from public schools to private schools and includes um, a hold harmless provision for rural school districts that were concerned about how uh, this program would have a financial impact on them. And so students will be eligible for this new program if they are currently enrolled in a public school they attended a public school for at least 90 percent of the previous year or are attending pre-k private and homeschool students will not be eligible so meaning if they are currently attendants of a private school or they've been exclusively homeschooled these uh, educational savings accounts will be supervised by the state comptroller in tandem with a newly formed organization called the Educational Assistance Organization. And so this bracketing strategy that's caused some controversy um, will be in effect for the rural school districts with fewer than 20,000 students, and they will receive this hold harmless payment of $10,000 in state funding for each student who decides to leave the district. Okay. So there was an additional parental rights bill associated with the proposal you just talked about. Tell us about that. 
Yeah. So this parental rights portion um, says that it leaves the moral and religious upbringing of the child up to the parents and allows parents to transfer their children between school districts if seats are available. And school districts would not be able to withhold information regarding students from the parents, and they will have an opportunity to review instructional materials if they are able to get 25% of the, of the parents to sign a petition for access. Individual parents will have an opportunity to uh, file local grievances um, with a proposed procedure if a grievance is filed in regards to critical race theory or the sexual instruction in the schools, then the TEA will conduct an internal hearing. And the bill also prohibits the school, the State Board of Education from adopting any sexual orientation or sexual identity curriculum into the curriculum. There was, in addition to that, another education-focused bill filed along with those proposals. Tell us what this last one would do. Yeah, so there was an accompanying uh, bill that was filed that will uh, secure teacher pay raises and allow teachers to terminate their contracts without losing their certifications. It, it will also include supplements for teachers and districts with less than 20,000 students, as well as mentorship and residency programs. Teachers will be able to receive funding for bilingual teaching certifications, and they will receive tuition-free pre-K for their own children. What was also interesting is there was a provision that will allow teachers the discretion to remove students from the classroom for disruptive behavior. And the teachers will have to submit a written report to the principal, and then there will be written consent to bring the student back into the classroom after the removal. There you go, Cameron. Well done covering that issue. Hayden, Representative Matt Schaefer introduced a bill to legislatively declare an invasion on the border and set up a border protection unit. What are some of the highlights of this bill? Representative Schaefer's bill would set up different uh, government uh, outlines for handling border policy, and the border protection unit is probably the most prominent in the bill. Um, but it would create a unit within the Department of Public Safety that is akin to the state having its own border patrol. And according to Speaker Phelan, who has backed this bill, it would be designed to relieve the National Guardsmen and other law enforcement personnel that have been on the border uh, with Operation Lone Star um, pursuing border security efforts. Uh, this legislation would create a border patrol chief in the state of Texas that would be appointed by the governor, and it contains um, strict severability clauses. So it is the legislation prepares itself uh, to be contested in the courts by um, more or less saying that if any portion of the bill is uh, stricken by the courts, that the the remainder of the bill uh, will remain in effect. And it has an inspector general's office established as well to oversee the border patrol unit to uh, ensure that the unit is spending taxpayer dollars wisely. But the centerpiece of this bill is it invokes the invasion clause of the U.S. Constitution. We've talked about this. Um, I, I feel like a broken record at times. So we've <laughs> talked about the invasion argument uh, extensively on this on this podcast, so I won't uh, regale everyone with the complexities of that now, but it takes what uh, Governor Abbott has done and puts it into state law uh, with regard to Article 1, Section 10. And it says that Texas is being invaded and it cannot delay responding to the, the so-called invasion, like uh, numerous counties have done uh, passing their own documents. It also creates a legislative oversight committee that would advise um, the speaker and the lieutenant governor and other portions of the legislature on border security policy, and uh, it would create the state. It would create a state version of the Title Forty Two program um, for future COVID nineteen emergencies or if there's a, a vaccination requirement uh, put in place. So that those are some of the mechanics of uh, Representative Schaefer's bill. What were some of the comments in support of the bill, and who came out in support of the bill? Well, Speaker Phelan, um, as I mentioned, he stated his support for the bill. 
He said, addressing our state's border and humanitarian crisis is a must-pass issue for for the Texas House this year. And I thank Representatives Guillen and Schaefer for filing House Bills 7 and 20, respectively, which, when combined, will lead to a safer Texas that overall reduces the cost to taxpayers, end quote. And HB 7 refers to uh, the bill that Representative Guillen filed, and of course he represents a border district, uh, that would provide the funding mechanism for Schaefer's bill, and it would set up uh, special court programs to handle some of the legal uh, complexities that would go with having uh, the state having its own uh, border patrol or border protection force. Uh, Schaefer and Guillen put out a statement together. They said, quote, this bold new approach for securing our border will, will require us to come together in the coming weeks to help achieve the goal shared by us all keeping Texans safe, end quote. But of course, there were um, some unfavorable comments about the bill as well. Representative Trey Martinez Fisher, on behalf of the Texas House Democratic Caucus, said, quote, Texans deserve to have solutions created and bills authored by folks whose knowledge of the border goes beyond what's covered by Tucker Carlson on Fox News. Spicy quote. Definitely. He said, instead, the extremist author of this bill likely knows more about the border with Oklahoma than with Mexico living more than 500 miles away in Tyler. Oof. So some pretty strong comments against this bill. (laughs) When I was editing that piece, I was reading, I was reading those quotes for the first time and they were, I I loved him. I love a spicy quote. And that gave everything that needed. Um, I mean, just objectively, they did a good job with that statement. Yeah. 100%. Um, Thank you, Hayden, for your coverage and, We'll continue to watch what happens there. We, it was a long-awaited proposal, to say the least. So we're excited to and have Phelan details. Had teased, yeah, Phelan had teased this for a while. And yeah. he said that it will challenge federal law. Was it innovative? Is that the word he used to he describe said it? it? Would be innovative. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. There you go. Thank you, Hayden. Brad, this week, the State Affairs Committee in the House held a hearing on Chairman Dustin Burroughs' lightning rod of a local preemption bill. How'd that go? So it was very lengthy, at least as far as hearings go for something that is not, you know, one of the top issues um, in the legislature. Like we saw literally hours and hours and hours of testimony on the elections bill last session multiple times because of the specials. So it wasn't like that, but it was still lengthy and quite heated, and especially for this early in session. And so... Burroughs' HB 2127, I think we discussed it on a previous podcast, but it would prohibit localities from passing regulations that exceed state law in certain specific codes. Not everything, just certain codes that they lay out in the bill. Uh, It would also allow certain people to sue localities who violate that provision and waives governmental immunity for it. So at the beginning of the hearing, Burroughs introduced a committee sub. Uh, Often this happens. Uh, because of feedback gotten after bills filed, they find may find issues, holes in the bill. They try and fix that, introduce that in committee. Um, so this had three main tweaks to it. It added the property and business and commerce codes to the a list of those that would be subject to the preemption. Um, the I think property one. Burroughs said specifically was added at the behest of like apartment associations. There's a lot of uh, not I'm sure rent control is part of it, but there's a lot of restrictions, zoning restrictions, building codes, all these kinds of things that especially apartment builders are dealing with in these big blue cities. And that is likely a big reason why they they requested that. Uh, the The second change is it instead of previously it would allow anybody in Texas to bring suit on this. It restricted it to uh, someone injured, quote, actually or threatened to be injured uh, by a specific action from a locality uh, or an association representing one of those people. Um, So it shrunk the pool of people that could sue. um, And uh, in in Burroughs' estimation, it, it still accomplishes the same goal because affected parties may still challenge these, these laws under the, under the preemption proposal. And the third one was previously you could bring suit in any county. And now it has to be either in the county of the regulation you're challenging or an adjacent one. And the thinking there is that a lot of these counties 
um, they're very blue and their judiciaries are very blue as well. And so from the Republicans in the, in the legislature's perspective, challenges would be dismissed a lot more because of, of these, uh, of the makeup of the, the judiciary in these places. So um, that was the chain. Those were the changes. Uh, overall, Burroughs' intention is to create a proactive response to local government ordinances, uh, such as the one being considered in Dallas that would ban gas-powered lawn equipment, rather than being reactive, responding to an individual policies after the fact, as he put it, playing whack-a-mole. No, well, again, quite a quote. What was the reception like generally? So supporters, especially business owners, praise the bill for being a better solution to the issue of what they see as oppressive regulations set by local governments. Uh, that by and large make doing business more difficult. And that goes for, you know, there were apartment associations that, that came, there was barbecue joints that came in and testified in favor of the bill, all kinds of businesses. And then opponents, mainly progressive activists, representatives of localities or of labor unions or groups that act like labor unions, uh, decried the bill as impairing cities home rule status in the ability to govern their own jurisdictions as they see fit. This is an interesting debate. I talk about it in the piece. I won't go into it here, but um, there's a lot of history and uh, to this, this theme that we see. Uh, more than anything else, this comes down to a fight between the red state legislature pushing back on blue cities who've increasingly adopted employment, environment, and other regulations that exceed what state law lays out. And then at the end of the hearing, the committee sub was withdrawn and the bill left pending. It's, it doesn't always happen, but it's not an unusual occurrence. It uh, can be standard procedure. Uh, it doesn't really damage the chances of the bill advancing out of committee into the floor. Should the bill make it to the House floor, I expect a huge effort uh, by opposing members, specifically Democrats, to amend or kill it. Um, Would this be another issue where potentially rural Republicans in certain areas of the state team up with Democrats? I think it depends on the final form of the bill. Listening to the hearing, there were multiple rural Republicans on the State Affairs Committee that expressed concerns about the original form of the bill and then uh, sided kind of with Burroughs after the committee sub was introduced. One of those, for example, one of those was Representative Smithy uh, in Amarillo, I believe. Um, he was he was a bit concerned with the the broad nature of it in the first place, and then after the tailor or the changes were made, he um, uh, he was more amenable to it, and it sounded like he was supportive of the bill. So it's still possible. Uh, Democrats killed two versions of an employment preemption bill last session: one in regular session, one in special uh, by. Uh, Chubbing, which I'm sure we'll get to talk about during the legislature once things actually get started to vote on on the floor. But uh, this is something that Democrats especially and the Democrats on the committee were vehemently opposed to. And I think they're going to fight tooth and nail to prevent it from passing. Brad, thanks for your coverage. Matt, coming back to you, it was a busy week all around and in the Texas Senate specifically for election law related issues. What were the five bills that you reported on this week? Senator Brian Hughes, uh, once again, uh, who chairs the Senate State Affairs Committee, was the author of two of the five election bills up for consideration on Monday, Senate Bills 747 and Senate Bill 921. 921 drew the most attention as it clarifies under state law that ranked choice voting is illegal in Texas, particularly in Texas cities, many of which are presently using that election method. Don't ask me to explain how it works. Uh, and that was one of the things that uh, Hughes pointed out um, is that it is um, a bit of a complicated process during the debates on the bill. Um, Senate Bill 747, on the other hand, cleared up some issues in Texas election law where if a primary runoff candidate withdraws, then any third place candidate who ran in the primary would qualify to be placed on the runoff ballot to give voters a choice in that election, uh, whereas right now they've had some instances where one of the two runoff candidates withdraws and the other person has just declared the victor default and the, the voters don't get a second round of voting on that issue. 
Uh, so those are Hughes's two bills. Uh, the other legislation is carried by Senator Paul Betancourt, uh, who also had two bills, including Senate Bill 221, which establishes guidelines for home rule cities that hold referendum elections to ensure election language clearly communicates to the voters what the measure does. His other bill, Senate Bill 825, clarifies that election code requirements for filing a recount petition after an election, uh, pointing to a recent election issue in Harris County. The bill extends the time to file a petition by one day and clarifies that the deadline cannot occur on a weekend or a holiday. Lastly, Senator Drew Springer uh, had legislation, Senate Bill 1052, that extends the amount of time that an election judge may be paid for work performed before the polls open. Current law provides that they may only be paid for one hour of work preparing to open the polls. Springer contends that there are numerous examples where judges have had to work for multiple hours prior to the polls opening to prepare the election site. His bill would remedy this by extending the amount of time of eligible paid time from one hour to two hours before the polls open. All of the bills are presently pending before the committee. Would it be fair to say that SB 747 took flight this week? Oof. Oh, zing. Thank you. <laughs> I simply how, cannot how believe. How painful was that for you? It was. Did you see it on my face? Yes, oh, I yeah. That, yeah. I had it oh. in the back of my mind, too. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to live through you on that see, one. See, oh. that was weird because it sounded like Mackenzie's voice. <laughs> but I am 90% confident that that was Daniel. So my brain is confused. (laughs) Oh, that really hurt my soul. Oh, brother. Okay. Well, you boys, all of you, I'm looking over at Daniel in his office. Let's see if he can hear. No, I don't think he notices at all. We can also barely see him because it's a one-way mirror. I know. That's kind of creepy too. Yeah, let's all just look at him until he, somebody throws something out the window. Oh. Okay. I feel that he has no idea we're staring. No at him. idea. He's going to edit this and be like, "What the heck is happening?" Okay, Cameron. We're moving on to you, Matt. Thanks so much for your coverage. Representative Nate Schatzline filed a bill to attempt to curtail minors from viewing sexual material online. Tell us what this specific bill does. So this bill uh, will require social media platforms and websites to perform an age verification process to access the site. If the site has more than one third of its content labeled as sexual material harmful to minors, the age verification process would be performed either by the site itself or through a third party system. And the bill requires that no information used in the ID process uh, be retained. If a website is found to be publishing such material without access measures or retaining information, of the user during the verification process, they would be liable to the parent of the minor for damages resulting from access to the material. So the age verification process is obviously very interesting, but is there any precedence for this and how do they plan to accomplish this? So Texas is not the only state to attempt to require age verification online. Um, Louisiana passed something similar last year. Louisiana requires age verification using government-issued identification or a public or private transaction data. If an individual in Louisiana attempts to access a website that is at least one-third sexual material, they are directed to confirm their identity through an app called LA Wallet, which was developed by the state government to digitize the driver's license. And Texas has a similar program that they launched last year called Texas by Texas that creates a single digital identity or an SDI for access to services and agencies. So these SDIs could be used for online ID for access to these types of websites, but it's primarily used for renewing driver's licenses. But uh, it's only this is only one part of a larger framework for this Texas by Texas platform. The Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation was used as the pilot program for instituting these types of services. And we've actually seen other countries have policies like this. The UK had an online safety bill that prevents uh, children from accessing potentially harmful material online through an ID verification by a third party vendor. And then Australia's online safety system 
requires age verification by giving Google access to government IDs for viewing certain material. So there is precedence for a bill like this. And the ID process is very interesting. Online privacy is something that I'm personally interested in. So this is something I'll be following. Thank you, Cameron. Brad, the two chambers have continued their fight over appraisal reform. What happened this week? Both chambers, the House and the Senate, held committee hearings this week for their preferred versions of appraisal reform. Uh, a reduction of the, in the appraisal cap and extension to commercial property in the House and a homestead exemption increase paired with a business tax credit and a business personal property tax exemption increase in the Senate. That's a lot. Um, in the back mic uh, tomorrow, today, for release of this podcast, there's a breakdown of, of the various items within the property tax plans that you can look at. But I think it's first important to note that uh, both chambers largely agree on the feature of the property tax issue this session, which is rate compression, using state dollars to buy down, in this case, school district maintenance and operations rate. There's not a lot of daylight between the two versions on that. Now, on this appraisal reform, there is a Grand Canyon size amount of daylight between these uh, between the two plans, and so they are really taking the fight to one another on this. Um, if you if you check out the piece, you can see the different arguments from the chambers. Basically, it comes down to this: the House believes that lowering the appraisal cap to 5%, currently it's 10% only for homesteads, and extending it to businesses, all commercial property, would provide uh, enough of a downward pressure on property tax bills permanently. On the Senate side, they see the fact that it's more indirect uh, pressure applied to tax bills, as in it's uh, the cap does not buy down anything or doesn't increase exemptions, none of that. That doesn't happen immediately. It's over time. So the Senate sees that, and they prefer homestead exemption increases. Uh, they argue because it will provide more immediate effect on property tax bills. Um, the Senate, uh, because they are trying to raise the homestead exemption to deal with business uh, business, uh, the business side of things, they have proposed an increase in, in an exemption. Now they've proposed a $25,000 uh, BPP exemption. Abbott has called for $100,000. The difference is that they also are proposing this tax credit, inventory tax credit. And so this is something I think will be very hard for the two chambers to agree on. I'm not sure where they're going to come down. And I know it's, you know, knock on wood, already talking about special sessions, but this is something that could cause one because the two chambers are so far apart on this, on this issue. So something to watch, even though in the grand scheme of the property tax issue, it is a minor component, but clearly it's very politically important for both chambers. Certainly. Bradley, thank you. Cameron, back to you. Another controversial bill that you have been following caught uh, a lot of attention online. Tell us what it does. So this bill is aimed at disincentivizing children's presence at drag performances by allowing a minor in attendance to levy civil action against the drag performer. A minor who attends a drag performance will have the ability to bring a civil action against one who knowingly promotes, conducts, or participates in the performance. And if the claim prevails in the court, then they can be awarded up to $5,000. Um, this gained a lot of attention online, like you mentioned, because there was a transgender rights activist who posted the details of this legislation and called it a bounty hunter drag ban. And those accusations refer to the damages rewards uh, claiming it would cause individuals to seek out these types of events to file lawsuits. There you go. Um, this isn't the first time this bill has been labeled, or a certain bill like this has been labeled as a bounty hunter law. Tell us about the abortion laws specifically in this case. Yeah, so Senate Bill 8, the Texas Heartbeat Act, 
which op uh, opponents claimed was an abortion bounty law, uh, c because as a statute that allows individuals to file a lawsuit against anyone who aids or abets an abortion and is awarded ten thousand dollars in damages. But as we know, this was challenged in court and was dismissed by a San Antonio court last December. And the judge based that ruling on the language stating only a person directly impacted by the abortion services in question, not just anyone, has standing to sue under SB 8. And so uh, because uh, Toth, his bill language on accountability and reward, uh, share similar language, uh, the ruling gives insight into how these future cases involving um, this bill might be handled. There you go. Cameron, thanks for your coverage. Matthew, coming back to you, boomerang and President Joe Biden signed an executive order on gun control this week. What does it do? Well, uh, in the order, uh, President Biden instructed federal agencies to further implement the Safer Communities Act legislation passed last year that carried bipartisan support, including from Texas Republican Senator John Cornyn. Cornyn received pushback from Texas Republicans over his uh, vote on the legislation, if you'll recall, in the news stories last year. In the details, Biden is uh, seeking to expand federal background checks on firearms purchases, place licensed gun dealers under heightened scrutiny, and in particular, look for ways to expand red flag type laws or what are known as extreme risk protective orders that allow law enforcement to confiscate firearms before a crime is committed. The order doesn't only deal with gun control measures, but it also instructs federal agencies to find ways to promote safe, uh, safe firearms handling education for the general public. Uh, and lastly, the order also instructs federal agencies to find ways to provide greater access to mental health care, in particular victims of firearms-related crimes. There you go. Matthew, thank you. Hayden, last but not least, the Texas Department of Public Safety issued a strong warning against traveling to Mexico. What did DPS have to say? For once, I would like you to put one of my stories at the end and when we get there, say, and last and definitely least. <laughs> I just think that would be funny. <laughs> anyway, the Texas Department of Public Safety warned people not to go to Mexico for spring break on account of cartel violence. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, excuse me, Colonel Stephen McCraw, director of DPS, said, quote, drug cartel violence and other criminal activity represent a significant safety threat to anyone who crosses into Mexico right now. We have a duty to inform the public about safety, travel risks and threats based on the volatile nature of cartel activity and the violence we are seeing there. We are urging individuals to avoid travel to Mexico at this time, end quote. And this is, of course, in view of two Americans tragically losing their lives on a trip to Mexico. Two others were abducted with them, but thankfully they were not killed and they have been uh, returned to the States for medical care and treatment. There you go. Hayden, thank you. Moving on to our tweetery section. Um, Matt, why don't we go ahead and start with you? I really oh, like this one. Okay. It makes me excited, yeah, even yeah. though I'm not going to be present for this event. Okay. Me neither, unfortunately. <laughs> Sad days. Yeah, but my parents will be there. We love that. So I am from a little town in far southwest Texas, up in the mountains. Yes, Texas has mountains, uh, called Fort Davis. And I noticed that it is in the news that um, there is snow in the forecast this weekend for all three days. Uh, actually, pretty decent snow predictions. So while the rest of Texas is spring breaking and all that sort of stuff uh, in our far southwest corner, um, we're we're Still getting a little bit of wonder, winter wonderland. So uh, my parents are visiting our place this weekend. So it uh, they should be there for this uh, late spot of winter that, that the state will be encountering. So I thought that was a little bit of a fun fact that, that popped up on Twitter. Certainly is. I would like to note that it has been 50 to 60 all week and I wore a sweater today and it is supposed to be 80 degrees today. How is it supposed to be 80 today? It's cloudy outside. It says that it's supposed, I think it's muggy heat. Like Ugh. there will be supposedly sun, thunderstorms and it should be 81 degrees by like 4 or 5 p.m. Right when we're getting off of work. Right when I'm walking to my car. <laughs> Not that I've thought about this at all. I will all. be staying inside <laughs> until it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lanta. Cameron, what about you? 
So uh, Elon Musk is going to be starting up his own town Ooh. here in Texas. Uh, he's calling it Project Amazing and has <laughs> named the town Snailbrook. Because snail uh, brook, I believe so. Like a little slug, but with a shell, and then yeah. brook like a babbling. Well, because uh, there's <laughs> there's a little motto with his boring company that they want to build machines that move faster than a snail. Oh, and so he plans on building 110 homes for his employees if they want to live on the co- in the company town. It, it'll be eight hundred dollars a month. And if you get fired, you have 30 days to leave the premises. <laughs> <laughs> so even though he's, he, he did send uh, a lot of his production for one of his companies, I think it was Tesla, back to California. But still, he, he does have a lot of employees here in, here in Texas. So he's making his own town here. Oh, wow. This is 110 homes in Bastrop County. Yeah. Huh. I don't like it. <laughs> no? no? I know. Brad, I what's your like problem it. with that? Well. So I live on the other side of the airport, pretty close to Bastrop. So we go there frequently just to hang out. They have a nice downtown area by the river. And he's just speeding up population growth there. So soon it'll be impossible to live there, impossible to afford, unless you're, you know, working at Tesla and paying $800 a month to live on his compound. But yeah. What? I, compound? I, why couldn't he have chosen, you know, I don't know, anywhere else? <laughs> <laughs> That's just my. So it's a personal gripe. Yes, it's a personal gripe. Elon, if you're listening, Brad, we are supposedly Elon's listening. Elon, if you're listening, we are aiming know, to remove ourselves us. from the story and be objective. So this take is sorry. Unwelcome. This one I cannot abide. <laughs> Although I will agree with you abide. that nothing is more sad than being in a in a nice little downtown area and a and it seems like it used to be a, a tight knit town and it has just yeah. been engulfed by concrete yeah. and developments i'm i'm more of thinking about the prospect of buying a house in a few years time and seeing the prices in austin yeah. and if elon does that to bastard well, i'm gonna be angry well, <laughs> i am gonna continue to defend uh good old elon uh i'm a big believer in innovation and entrepreneurship and expansion and are you all hoping the good he listens to this podcast Texas, huh? are you hoping he listens to this podcast and offers you one of his 110 homes <laughs> is that the angle here no but uh, i just love all things space but i also love all things free economics and and good growth and what makes texas awesome everybody wants to come here because we're awesome we have opportunity we're expanding everything's great and you know there's no u-hauls in california because they're all over here and things like that so yeah um, well one of the reasons that people are leaving california in droves is that costs so much to live there so as with everything matthew and trade-offs what and texas is awesome texas is awesome i will agree with that yeah okay people aren't coming here because Texas is awesome there. They're coming here for economic reasons. Because we're awesome. But like you're not coming here with the Texas flag in the back of their pickup truck, like, yay, we're Texans now. Some like, are though. Not, I don't know. Cameron, are do you here. have a Texas so? flag on the pick- back of your car yet? Uh I'll work on it. We'll work on it. Hayden, <laughs> what about you? <laughs> <laughs> you're already chuckling. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Well, this is a thread by a guy named Andy. Again, I have no idea who this person is. But it's Andy. Yeah. Hi, Andy. I, um, <laughs> I guess there's a, his last name is in his Twitter handle, but whatever. <laughs> this graphic is... He, all of these are just different graphics of um, silly little things, but he, he said, my go-to workout, and it's just this chart, and it says... 30 minutes of cardio and then a little quote that says I need food and then five years of rest. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and I relate to this cause I, I think in 2017 I ran on the treadmill for a little bit and I'm still recovering. So I related to this. Your hamstring is still. Yeah. In repair. I'm still in rest time. I don't understand why people run on treadmills. It is so sad. I'm with you. It's a sad. I, I do run exercise. on treadmills. I run on the treadmill occasionally, but not Ugh. as often as I should. I love the treadmill. 
Really? It's I would awesome. so much rather be outside. I'd rather be outside, but if you want to do a structured workout, there's nothing better. You're totally right. Than the treadmill. It's so much more controlled. And especially yeah. if you have like a certain amount of, yeah, I understand that argument for sure. But for me, it has to be paired with something else. I can't just go run on the treadmill and call that. Like I have to do treadmill and then maybe something else. Otherwise, I would go a little stir. Well, that's why you got to lock in with a good podcast or you got some pump up music going. That's then you true. just get in the zone. It's like zoop. That's the, true. How does that go? Zoop. Thank you. Yeah. There are some <laughs> other funny ones on here too. He has one that says best email signature. And there are three options. And two of them are X'd and one is checked. The, the three options were best sincerely and the one he picked was see you in hell <laughs> <laughs> have you ever gotten runner's high it's a real thing it's the dopamine so i've release. told and i've never gotten it you never have no not even when i ran a lot in high school really? when i played soccer yeah oh. no never got that i get it i, I get it, chasing it though i i get it quite often when i'm riding my bike mm. oh. not not so much running but when i'm riding my bike and um, just cause you're out there for so long and you can kind of just let your mind go. So I don't know. I, I feel it definitely. Hmm. There you go. Brad, what about you? This is also, we'll pivot into our, uh, fun topic for this podcast. So the house and Senate both hosted a pretty famous actor, honored him on the floor of each of the respective, uh, floor of chambers. And you're in Texas. We're talking about yes, you're in Austin. Yes. And they typically do this a lot uh, at the beginning of session when they have a lot of free time when they're not, you know, hearing bills and whatnot. So uh, they hosted Dennis Quaid, who by reports that I've heard is kind of a strange person personally, but I, that's just rumors I've heard. Um, but by golly, does he have some wonderful movies? and legend fa- yeah yeah legend oh you said pretty well known the, the guy's a legend yeah, yeah. this is like okay. he's pretty darn <laughs> yeah he's, at one point he was like a-list a-list yeah. yeah my favorite was the rookie about uh it's about, actually based on a real story a guy who uh at like age 40 or something all of a sudden jumped to the major leagues and pitched because he had a, an insane arm but uh, that was my favorite, but he's got quite a few. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd say the rookie would be like, that's our fun topic. Let's talk about Dennis Quaid movies being that he had just visited the Texas Capitol this week. Uh, the rookie is up there for me too. I love that movie, but parent trap based oh, on a small little West Texas town, by the way, as I recall, maybe yeah. look it up. Yeah, yeah. He's, it's, it starts in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I forget. It's been so long since I've seen it. I don't remember the details, but. The first scene is is guys playing baseball in ye olden days with pump jacks. Yeah, in the distance. That's so, pretty cool. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think it was Ira Ann, but I can't remember for sure. One of those little West Texas yeah. oil, oil filled towns. Oh, that's so cool. Parent Trap is the other one that is my favorite. It's Great. such a classic. Did you ever eat Oreos with peanut butter? One hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Well, at my grandparents' house, it was the movie we'd watch every. Uh, time we visited them they had it on vhs we'd go watch it my favorite i watch on my cousins i love i just love the original parent or well, not the original this is not the original the technically lohan it's the one. second one the Lindsay lohan dennis quaid gosh what was the the mom's she's so lovely i can't remember that actress's name british yeah right. regardless that was oh it's so good i just want to know when the legislature is gonna honor the even more famous quaid brother <laughs> Randy Quaid. I don't know what you're talking about. What? You don't know who Randy Quaid is? No. Cousin Eddie? Oh. <laughs> That's from, his brother. From, that is oh, that is Christmas brother. vacation. Christmas vacation. Oh, okay. Save the neck for me, Clark. Oh my gosh. You know? That's uh, hilarious. Uh, he's also like, oh god, he's got so so many great movies like uh you ever see Kingpin or oh, yeah. uh, like uh, Independence Day and he's the crazy <sighs> pilot? Yep. Uh, and everything so many funny movies uh and he is a bit of a character too if you've ever seen oh, his, yeah. if you've ever seen his twitter it's 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 a trip well some other famous movies that uh dennis quaid was in include the day after tomorrow which is an interesting movie i'm also looking at his discography is that how you say it discography yeah. 
he has been in, in so many movies even recently that I had no idea about. Like Apparently. the guy just pumps out movies. Yeah. Looking for He's a got payday. A new one coming out soon. I Sheesh. haven't heard of it, but uh, he was in he was Sam Houston in the Alamo. That's relevant. Wow. Back in two thousand four. Reagan. Oh, did he? Yeah. That's pretty crazy. So yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Um Cameron, do you have any favorite Dennis Quaid movies? Oh, it has to be The Rookie. So I, good. The, I've seen that movie so many times. Yeah. It, you know, the moments where he parks his car next to the speed limit sign, throws the ball, and it says 76 miles an hour or something, and then he walks by it all disappointed, and then it flashes 96. 96 yeah, yeah, and it's like, oh, wow. <laughs> what was the hardest you threw? Oh, I, did, I never touched 90. Okay. Unfortunately. Were you a lefty or? Right? No, I was right-handed. Right. Okay. But no, I was a I was a more control guy and threw a lot of two seamers, sliders. You were you were a pitcher, not a thrower. Right. I wish I could throw hard. I maybe I wouldn't have stopped playing in college. <laughs> no. There you go. Um, I was talking with a friend earlier this week, and they were saying, "Yeah, we're like halfway through the legislative session," and I. It was like, yeah, we almost are. And then Hayden said in our docket here that we're literally like Monday is literally our halfway point, which is crazy to think about. Yeah. I just did some Googling on uh, the movie The Rookie. Uh-huh. It was based on Big Lake, Texas. Big uh-huh. Lake, Texas. Now we know. Thank you for your fact checking. Anyways, but yeah, no, we're, thanks to Hayden, we know we're, Monday is a halfway point in session. That's and, pretty crazy. And now things are really starting to happen. Yeah, so folks, definitely keep an eye out. We'll be following everything as closely as possible. Make sure to go to the Texan.news. I know we had talked about a lot of stories today and teased more information on our site, but really that's where you can get all the details from these stories. So make sure to go to the Texan.news and subscribe. Folks, thanks so much for listening and we'll catch you on next week's podcast. Thank you to everyone for listening. If you enjoy our show, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you want more of our stories, subscribe to The Texan at thetexan.news. Follow us on social media for the latest in Texas politics and send any questions for our team to our mailbag by DMing us on Twitter or shooting an email to editor at thetexan.news. We are funded entirely by readers and listeners like you. So thank you again for your support. Tune in next week for another episode of our weekly roundup. God bless you and God bless Texas. Texas.